I am Katherine Santoro, Director of Policy and Development at the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation, and on behalf of NICM, welcome to our webinar today. With less than a week to go until open enrollment for 2017 coverage begins, we're pleased to have an excellent panel of experts with us today to weigh in on the prognosis for the exchanges. Before we hear from them, I'd like to thank NICM's President and CEO, Nancy Chalkley, who led the development of today's webinar, as well as the NICM staff who helped to convene this event today. <clears throat> you can find biographical information for all of our speakers along with today's agenda and copies of their slides on our website. We also invite you to live tweet during the webinar today using the hashtag ACAExchanges. And now to help us understand a little more about how the ACA has impacted premiums and how the individual market has changed since 2014, we're pleased to have Lauren Adler, Associate Director of the Center for Health Policy, the Brookings Institution, to share his research with us today. Lauren? Hi, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Erica, for that great presentation as well. Um, yeah, I think, uh, Right now, I think, obviously, the attention is understandably and rightfully so focused on the large premium increases coming for 2017, especially with the big news earlier this week reported by HHS and ASPE um, about the 22% increase in uh, premiums for the benchmark plan. Um, and yes, obviously, the increase is very widely across the country, and uh, subsidies are protect protecting very a lot of these people uh, uh, from those increases, and many people can choose new plans, uh, again, as Erica was uh, walking through. Um, but I also want to take a step back here uh, to put the ACA's premiums in perspective even for the rest of the unsubsidized population. Um, as you can see here, uh, this slide now looks slightly out of date now that we have some data on 2017, um, especially from the HHS data now, but the uh, I think this has been a talk, very talked about point, but the fact that premiums came in significantly below, 15 to 20 percent below what the Congressional Budget Office, uh, Congress's neutral uh, scorekeeper, a group of economists basically, <laughs> uh, thought premiums would come in uh, originally um, is certainly part of the story for why we are seeing such large premium increases for 2017. Uh, there was certainly an element of underpricing initially and uh, an additional data point in that ASPE analysis was that we uh, that we are actually now for 2017 uh, premiums in the ACA on average nationally uh, are going to be pretty much exactly in line uh, with where uh, the Congressional Budget Office predicted they would be in 2017, which honestly is a uh, for all the flax CBO takes uh, a lot of the time some some are and some not. Uh, it's a pretty remarkable feat to do that. Uh, I don't know maybe some of the uh, should have assigned some of the CBO economists to the co-op plans, maybe. Um, but uh, I think we are seeing some of that, and that just gives you some context of how premiums started. And I think even more than that, uh, this next slide uh, right here um, shows this is also taken from Congressional Budget Office data um, that uh, me and my colleague Paul, uh, Paul Ginsburg um, basically extrapolated and analyzed from looking at premiums in the non-group market for comparable plans before the ACA, uh, showing that premiums in the ACA actually also appeared low um, in 2014 and 2015 uh, compared to non-group uh, comparable plans in the non-group market before the ACA. Uh, again, that's an important thing to note when you're uh, talking about these big premium increases coming this year. Again, basically unwinding the low premiums we saw originally. Um, and uh, I think we just uh, walk through, and obviously I think that finding uh, seems jarring at first glance because there's obviously a number of elements in which the Affordable Care Act pushes up premiums in the individual market. Obviously the guaranteed issue being a big one that you have to sell insurance every, at everyone and that you can't turn away, uh, you can't turn away people when they're sick or stop insurance when people get sick. Uh, obviously, there's certain minimum benefits you have to provide, essential health benefits and such. Uh, you have to have out-of-pocket limits on your health insurance, and uh, you can't have lifetime limits on the benefits you provide. Um, but on the flip side, there are also a number of elements of downward pressure on premiums that the ACA um, did provide into this market. Um, a big one um, on which the McKinsey presentation focused on a lot is the 
pretty, uh, pretty large rise of narrow network plans um, and managed care offerings inside the, the individual market now, um, and, which, uh, and their data had shown that basically the premiums in these narrow network plans are generally about 20% lower than their broad network counterparts. Um, obviously having a big role in that, at least back, uh, in that, not to 2017, so back in 2016. Uh, obviously, plenty of anecdotal evidence that provider reimbursement in the in ACA plans has been lower than in the rest of the commercial market. Um, and then also just simply by creating a transparent marketplace where, at least from survey data, we have seen that the consumers, uh, ACA consumers, seem to be very price sensitive, um, which should uh, drive down premiums uh, on the whole. Um, I just want to uh, caveat some of this sort of perspective data, just that uh, the, the Congressional Budget Office data is a little bit older on the non-group uh, market data from before the ACA, obviously. Um, and a big part of this is um, when looking at pre-2014 data, there is a very big difference between the mean and the median premiums. So uh, a big part of this is there were sick people who still were getting insurance. Uh, before the ACA. Uh, they were just paying very, very high premiums for that in many cases, or in some cases in high risk pools even. Um, but there were people paying $10,000 a year and such for premiums. So uh, from all of the data sources I've seen, the median premium uh, is often 60, 70 percent of what the mean would be nationally, um, which is why uh, all of the reports of people, you know, healthy people who are buying insurance in the market beforehand really did see these large premium increases when the ACA uh, took off and the people who continue buying coverage in the individual market. So I, I just, I don't want to imply that those people didn't see those premium increases and that, that sort of, uh, that's part of the reason it's just that the people who saw really high premiums before uh, saw very large decreases. So on average, um, that's sort of, a, they sort of even out in that sense, but that's a, uh, uh, they're looking at very broad averages, uh, sometimes disguises a lot of individual circumstances. Uh, again, the reinsurance component also um, that uh, lowered premiums in 2014 by anywhere from 10 to 17 percent I've seen estimates of and still was keeping premiums down by 6 percent or so this past year. Um, and again, obviously, premiums just differ very widely across the country. So it's, it's sort of unfair to these national comparisons sometimes are a little bit uh, unfair to make in some points. I think the real, the real point of making this is just to say uh, that the ACA in some ways has just not solved all of the problems of health insurance. Um, it's not that the ACA is somehow magically cheaper, which I think a lot of, a lot of cheerleaders of the ACA hoped that it could be miraculously cheaper than other modes of uh, delivering care. Um, and that seems to be, it seems to be moving back more in line with other uh, forms of delivering insurance, which kind of gets me to my next slide, which uh, there was an Urban Institute analysis recently, which showed a very similar finding, basically highlighting, it was sort of in line with what we had done, uh, highlighting that in 2016, uh, ACA premiums, uh, when adjusted to be of similar actuarial value, uh, effectively, especially just moving forward to 2017, effectively are basically equivalent to employer plan premiums, uh, it, it, they found that they were 10 percent lower, but with the premium increases coming this coming year, uh, the ACA premiums are going to be roughly the same as employer premiums across the country, although from this map you can see that the, they again uh, vary pretty widely um, and where things are different, but in some of the times this explains. So you're seeing, for instance, in 2017 the ACA, you are seeing big premium increases coming in New Mexico and Pennsylvania, for instance. However, those states also had very low premiums relative to ESI premiums in those states. So in some ways, it's not surprising that you are seeing <laughs> that you're seeing that happen in those states. Um, in a similar way that some of the big premium increases were coming in states that had just very low premiums relative to national averages to begin with. Uh, I, just to say that I think some of this is coming from uh, just trends re. Uh, trends coming back towards uh, the mean and things just sort of uh, coming back to normal as we're gaining experience and people are learning more um, about what's going on. Uh, all of this really is to say that healthcare is crazy expensive in the U.S., um, but that didn't start with, that didn't magically start with the Affordable Care Act. Um, when we spend 20 percent of our economy on healthcare, doctors make very healthy salaries, uh, hospitals often exert near monopoly power, 
uh, it shouldn't be a surprise that unsubsidized ACA premiums are also proving expensive for so many. Uh, and that's really the key point I want to make here. Uh, many of the problems attributed to the ACA are really broader in nature and therefore require us as policymakers uh, and the folks in D.C. to look at controlling health care costs more broadly than just uh, pigeonholing specifically to the ACA. Uh, and that doesn't mean that the ACA doesn't need improvement. It, it certainly does, uh, especially in certain markets um, where we really do need a ratio of high, uh, high, higher ratio of healthy people to sign up. But I, I think it's also important to put the news of ACA premiums in their proper context so that we can focus on solving the key problems uh, out there um, and fix what, um, what really needs to be fixed. And, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. <clears throat> As you've teed up, the experience of consumers and health plans is varied across the country, and we're excited to bring you all a panel of health plan speakers who have really been leaders and partners in helping consumers navigate coverage options under this new and changing regulatory environment, and we're going to hear their insights and innovations today. First, we'll hear from Calvin Anderson, Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs and Chief of Staff for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. Calvin? Thank you, Catherine, and uh, thank you everyone for joining in, and uh, Erica and Lauren who went ahead of me. Uh, I want to focus on uh, a couple of points. Uh, one that the cumulative impact from uh, marketplace uncertainty, you know, taking their toll on uh, us as an individual plan, but we think on insurers broadly, uh, there are some stabilization measures that uh, we think are required to help dissuade any further erosion in the uh, ACA participation. Uh, and that uh, we also need to focus on uh, some of the key cost drivers uh, that are very much a factor uh, within the uh, marketplace. So our experience in, in Tennessee, Blue Cross was fully committed from the start uh, and was the only uh, insurer uh, to offer plans statewide in the first three years of uh, the ACA marketplace uh, in all 95 counties of Tennessee. Uh, our three-year losses on ACA plans are approaching uh, just south of uh, 500 million. So that becomes a real financial impact and real dollars. As we assessed it, uh, we naturally uh, understood that there were fewer young, healthy members uh, that enrolled in the plan than what we had expected and that the risk pool never really uh, uh, grew large enough. Uh, the members uh, who did enroll had uh, far greater health needs uh, than uh, what we had anticipated and that the medical utilization continued to increase and led to significant losses each year, even as we went through painful uh, rate adjustments to try to close the gap between what we charge and what we pay for care. So the continued losses and what we uh, saw a lot of, the uncertainties about the law, led to difficult but necessary uh, decision to scale back on what will be our 2017 ACA participation footprint, going from eight regions uh, in the state uh, to five. Uh, it's important that we note, however, that we will still be the only carrier in 57 of the 95 uh, counties uh, in, in Tennessee. Uh, as we uh, look a little deeper and we talk about our experience uh, in Tennessee, uh, our 2015 highlights as we look at uh, average uh, individual uh, claims costs compared to members that are covered through employer plans. We found on the medical end it was 43% higher for those on the individual marketplace uh, and uh, on pharmacy uh, whopping 58% uh, higher than those who are covered uh, with employer coverage. Looking further as we look at those uh, same individual marketplace uh, individuals on utilization, again compared to employer, uh, those who get their coverage from employer, uh, emergency room uh, utilization was 14% uh, higher, uh, inpatient hospital 42% higher, and behavior health uh, being 67% uh, percent higher. Uh, than those who uh, receive their coverage uh, through work. And so 
the uh, individual marketplace claims versus premiums. We uh, uh, did analysis that says 5% of our individual marketplace members paid 9% of the group's total premiums, yet accounted for 73% of the uh, total claims cost. So again, that paints that uh, 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 very uh, clear cumulative impact uh, that that's producing on us for our three-year uh, experience in the market. Now, we, we also think that there are some things that can be done that will help stabilize uh, the marketplace and try to fulfill and improve some of the uh, risk performance. So we, we think that the ACA risk mitigation programs were designed to help insurers adjust to what was a new and uncertain marketplace. Uh, that uh, Tennessee is one of the bottom 10 states for consumer uptake on ACA plans. Typically, you'd want about 70% participation. Tennessee only had about 30% of eligible uh, consumers uh, sign up. And insurers typically price conservatively when entering a new market, trusting in the backstop that the uh, three R's were ex are expected to provide for a large risk pool. And many insurers offered prices in the beginning of the ACA marketplace that was predicated on the fact that the uh, three R's would uh, be in place and work as designed. So some of the solutions that we uh, you know, think about is that the risk corridors, which was modeled after the successful Medicare Part D program, uh, uh, really need to be uh, stabilized for this uh, new and uncertain market, and that the risk adjustments need to stay consistent, and that the uh, reinsurance program is fully funded by private sector contributions, and health plans lowered their 2016 rates based on these rules and should receive the payments on those higher claims. And, as a consequence, we should oppose any efforts to eliminate or limit the ACA uh, reinsurance uh, program. Likewise, we think a more balanced risk pool is necessary for long-term stability and affordability. Uh, rather than simply focusing on the increased enrollment, we do have to focus on promoting continuous coverage. Uh, in that regard, uh, we would be focused on trying to require some upfront verification for special enrollment periods. Uh, you know, we fully recognize that while some people uh, uh, have uh, special enrollment periods needs, it's important that the government should be validating that eligibility at the time of enrollment, uh, just like it does in Medicare Advantage and the Federal Employees Health Benefit Programs and just as we do uh, in the private sector should also be a, a look to limit the uh, premium payment grace period and align it more with where state standards are, which in Tennessee is uh, 31 days. And then third party uh, premium payments by organizations with vested financial interests should be something uh, that should be addressed because that's very important in stabilizing the marketplace and in helping to ensure that there isn't uh, further enrollment. Uh, or, or further uh, erosion within the, uh, the uh, marketplace. And then finally, in, in stabilizing uh, the ACA, we think that there need to be uh, some addressing of the medical and pharmacy costs. That uh, remember, we have a medical loss ratio provision where health insurers must spend 80% of premiums on medical costs or issue refunds. Uh, no other uh, health industry segment have administrative costs and profits determined by law. So uh, direct medical costs are uh, a real uh, impact on premium drivers. Case in point, uh, you can look at prescription uh, drug costs, where the ACA plan's pharmacy costs have been 20 to 33 percent higher than employer-sponsored uh, uh, cost and group plans. So uh, increasing drug cost transparency, limiting some direct consumer advertising, uh, and giving health plans greater flexibility to manage uh, cost-effective formularies are uh, areas where uh, we also see stabilization uh, can be affected by uh, uh, these actions on the ACA. And so uh, again, we. I firmly believe that the cumulative impact on the marketplace, uncertainties have taken their toll on insurers, and uh, 
and uh, uh, must uh, mitigate the risk to protect the financial security of all uh, that all members rely on. Uh, that stabilization measures are required to dissuade further erosion in the ACA participation, and that there really is a need to focus on the cost drivers that add to the uh, marketplace challenges uh, that affect uh, both insurers and consumers uh, alike. Thanks so much, Calvin, for highlighting some of the challenges you're facing and your perspective on policy changes and other solutions. <clears throat> we'll next hear from Dr. Prakash Patel, Chief Operating Officer of Guidewell Florida Blue and President of Guidewell Health, and he's joined by John Urbanic, Senior Vice President, Health Insurance Business at Florida Blue, and they're going to share their approach to this new market and what they've been learning in Florida. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm John Urbanic and I'm a Senior Vice President with Florida Blue. And first of all, we appreciate the opportunity to talk with you this afternoon and share our approach to the Affordable Care Act here in Florida. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to provide a general overview of our approach and then I'll turn it over to my colleague Prakash Patel who will provide some insights on the successful initiatives that we've undertaken with products and the delivery system and service models. I'll then finish up with a few recommendations that we have moving forward. So just getting started, um, even before the Health Care Affordable Care Act was implemented, it was clear to us at Florida Blue that individual decision making was becoming a key area of focus. We began as early as 2008 to develop key customer capabilities such as retail stores, direct sales, and engagement channels. We've also found that as consumers are now more involved in buying and making decisions, their expectations are becoming higher as well. So we continue to build on these original capabilities, but are also moving into the digital environment and we're working to connect with individuals in a way that they like to communicate. We also feel that finding ways to keep the customer involved with their plan is going to help improve their health and well-being. As we prepared to implement our strategy for the ACA in 2013, we also knew that consistent with our mission to help people and communities achieve better health, we needed to have a significant presence throughout Florida, and that meant being active in the entire state. We wanted to ensure that we didn't just survive health care reform, but rather thrive in that new ACA environment. And since the law was implemented, Florida Blue has been the only carrier to be in and remain active in all of Florida's 67 counties. We also understood that the ACA was going to create a new market, many people in this new market never having health insurance before, and lots of those people not even knowing what health insurance was. We wanted to be successful with this market for the long term, and so our initial strategy was to educate and to build trust. And as we move forward, we're focusing on providing the tools and the information that will allow members to make better decisions to improve their health. But we're also finding ways to strengthen the relationship and the partnership between the health care provider, the member, and us as the payer. With this new market, it's also clear that traditional promotional activities would not be enough. We needed to be there in person to help answer questions and help them make the best decisions. In each year since the first open enrollment period, we've held over 3,000 personal town hall meetings in communities throughout the state to be there for those who needed us. Our retail centers have helped thousands of individuals as well, and we have a dedicated distribution team that's ready for personal meetings and assistance. When it came to products and pricing, again, we planned for the long term, ensuring that we had the products that would meet the needs of this market, but also wanted to ensure that we had pricing that was sustainable. And finally, we've come to realize that we really have to do business differently. The traditional approach of bringing products to market and pricing based on our costs will no longer work. We found that you have to start with what the customer wants and is willing to pay, and then you have to design products and change your company to meet that price point. It's been an enlightening and exciting experience for us, but now we know that each year we'll need to design around customer needs and affordability in order to meet our goal of thriving in this market. So let me turn it over to my associate, Prakash Patel, to further tell our story. Thanks. Uh, John nicely outlined the importance of having depth and breadth in a market with the ACA. Clearly a nuanced, multi-layer uh, approach to succeed. I'm going to highlight how we translated that market approach 
to operational uh, execution. As we planned uh, implementation, we realized we would need to balance some strong countercurrents that are vastly different than our traditional commercial business. And that trying to overlay that commercial platform and engine to the ACA would not work. First of all, the majority of the ACA members were not familiar uh, with accessing health insurance products. And that combined with the social economic and language burdens only further underscore that we would not, that we would, excuse me, need to have a very hands-on approach to engaging, guiding, and educating these populations. Moreover, given these challenges in concert with the unmet medical needs these members have, and the fact that we introduced new insurance product designs, our providers also needed significant support to ensure the provision of optimal and uh, timely care. Undertaking all of these activities added significant administrative costs, yet the market need is to offer low-cost premium products. These realities uh, in combination put tremendous pressure on our operating margins, pushed disproportionately lower than our other lines of business with significant risk, as many plans experience, for possible losses as well, if not very closely managed. Thus, to help increase our chances to have a positive operating margin, we looked at our administrative processes from front end to back end and made a number of changes. For example, we added more automation in areas like IVR, self-service tools. We also streamlined our enrollment and billing processes, among other processes. Further, to achieve our overall market needs and objectives, fundamentally all of the action steps we undertook best translates into what we reference to here as a hyper-localized and a hyper-personalized approach very much integrated end-to-end -end and across all regions of our state and across all functional areas enterprise-wide. These collectively, we felt, laid the required foundational blocks to position us for success. You can see some of the functional areas we focused on listed here. I'll highlight a few of the areas, uh, primarily around care, delivery system, and analytics that we customized <clears throat> and changed for the ACA, which were dramatically different than what we utilize for our uh, commercial book of business. On this slide, historically, uh, and I think this is the experience that many of the health plans have had, we historically have used a centralized approach for medical and care management for our commercial employer marketplace because it worked well when dealing with a wealthier, healthier, more educated population. But for the ACA market, given these populations by and large unfortunately had not had access to healthcare before, we focused on more intense engagement with these patients, encompassing a wide uh, range of approaches, including leveraging our GuideWell Connect Florida Blue Health and Wellness sites for sales and service, care and HEDA support. Our customer service advocates were specifically trained to address the needs of these populations. We added a number of consumer digital tools significant language, um, specific content, and community events, uh, and incentivize our providers to jumpstart getting these members evaluated. And unlike the centralized approach to case management and care management, we also created 11 new internally localized multidisciplinary care management uh, groups to more effectively deal with a subset of the ACA around complex medical conditions and also to further build trust with members and providers. And these 11 groups were placed on, on a localized uh, basis across the state. We call these place the delivery teams or pods for short. <clears throat> on the delivery side, we sculpted the delivery network system to only, not only include some of our ACA uh, groups that uh, we know are of the highest quality and best positions that uh, were in the, the marketplace, but we also uh, leverage some of the groups that we actually happen to own through Gaiwa Health, all very, very focused on a hands-on uh, approach and uh, support on the continuum of care needs for these ACA members. Um, also, the clinical leadership was very primary care driven, and today majority of the strategic providers have incentive contracts in place for cost and uh, outcomes. Finally, none of our cross-functional work could have been done successfully without the tremendous investments we made in analytics, especially around capturing and conveying leading indicators around clinical episodes, 
uh, like ER visits, admissions, readmissions, authorizations for high variability care in high cost cases, and also pharmacy. And then we leverage this information to assist our internal teams and our pro partner provider groups to intervene as appropriate on behalf of the members for care gaps and risk scores because the ACA uh, clearly is not just about cost management, but it also is about capturing uh, codes accurately uh, and risk scores for the revenue side of the payment streams as well. John? Thanks, Prakash. And um, let me close out this session with just a few recommendations that we feel will improve the ACA moving forward. First, the concept of insurance is the ability to have a balanced risk pool, and we understand and support the need for special enrollment periods in an open enrollment environment, but it's important, however, that we enforce the rules around eligibility for special enrollment periods to protect the ability to maintain a balanced risk pool and not have carriers exposed to selection risk. Secondly, there needs to continue to be guidelines in place to minimize the payment of premiums by third parties. This is a potential source for fraud and abuse that's entirely preventable. Third, there's been a lot of turnover in the exchange market, and this can lead to an adverse risk pool. And one way to help minimize this churn is to require that individuals who left the market owing outstanding premium be required to satisfy that premium prior to re-enrolling in an ACA plan. And finally, there are differences in the grace period requirements between some states and the federal requirements, and this is creating a great deal of confusion and issues. We'd recommend that the federal grace period requirements be adjusted to align with those state requirements. Thanks so much, Dr. Patel and John, for sharing your insights and your perspective on what's needed to strengthen the market going forward. Our final set of health plan speakers join us from Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. We're so pleased to have Michael Considine, Vice President, Consumer, Small Group, and Mid-Size Markets, and Ed Lara, Vice President of Marketing and Product Development, with us to share their experience today. Okay, thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, this is Ed Lara and we're very pleased to be joining you all to uh, share our learnings. I'll start off with just an overview of the market factors as we were going into ACA, talk a little bit about our approach um, to our product and pricing strategy, and I'll turn it over to Mike who can talk in more detail about our uh, go-to-market uh, activities. So just to start us off here, uh, pre-ACA Horizon had the leading market share in the individual marketplace, but it's important to note that these folks were primarily in our basic and essential plan, which was essentially going away with the advent of ACA because it was a non-compliant uh, product. And so our challenge was how, do we, how would we retain the bulk of these members knowing we were going to be launching new plans at higher rates. Also, um, we, uh, we had uh, pre-ACA uh, specific uh, plans that were already available to high-risk consumers, but those high-risk consumers in New Jersey were also going to be thrown into the same risk pool once ACA started. And, and the last uh, point here is that uh, we had about 1.2 million residents who were estimated to have no insurance pre-ACA, and all our forecasting, our work with public policy folks showed that we would expect about 161,000 of those to come into the exchange. Um, our focus then was really trying to understand the uninsured coming into the marketplace, and we did a lot of testing, uh, conjoint research, a lot of product simulation, and similar to what other plants have talked about, the key findings we had here were, you know, no surprise, the uninsured were really looking for affordable plans and simplicity, not just in terms of ease of use, but in terms of the number of plants available, and that certainly guided our decisions for the type of pricing and product portfolios. So given all our research uh, beforehand, we intentionally went in with a very prudent pricing approach. We decided to uh, price for the whole book. We did not make any specific assumptions about gaining a significant share, say, of young uninsured. Um, and so we priced uh, for a reasonable margin. Uh, our, our view was it wasn't about a land grab 
at the onset, it was about creating a sustainable long-term business. And uh, once we uh, went into the marketplace in 2014, a couple of things, right? The first thing was that our pricing turned out to be much, uh, compared to our uh, competitors, our pricing was higher than we expected it to be with all our testing. So in other words, many of our competitors priced much lower than we thought they would. The second thing is, only about half of the uninsured that we expected to come into the marketplace actually uh, signed up for plans. And so the net result of this was in our first year um, of the ACA, we only saw a very modest 6% membership growth. And Mike's going to uh, allude to that a bit more later on. So for 2015, we sort of revised our posture to be more competitive but not reckless. And um, really, one of the ways we, we ensured we did this was we, we, from the get-go, tried to stay with a very simple product portfolio. We only offered five products in 2014 because we knew that's what our consumers wanted. And um, we didn't offer any platinum products either um, un un until this year. Uh, and the gold we offered in 2014 was part of a tiered network, uh, which, which brings me to uh, my next point here. Uh, the McKinsey folks at the very beginning and a couple of the other uh, presenters talked about how there's been a proliferation of, uh, pro proliferation of narrow networks um, because of the price advantage it provides. Um, we actually decided to go with a tiered network strategy, launched our first tiered network products, uh, which had about a 10% differential versus our broad product. Uh, and then we created another product, um, also a tiered product, called Omnia, which we launched last year. Um, and so that now has a 20%, 15 to 20% advantage versus our broad product. And we, we think it, it offers the best of both worlds. It offers the lower premium, lower out-of-pocket costs that consumers are looking for, but still gives them access to the broad managed network that Horizon has here in the state. So uh, all of those have really helped us. Um, the membership has uh, grown uh, much better since our first year of ACA. Uh, but obviously, um, as with many other states, we're facing some new challenges as uh, other companies are leaving. And so uh, a lot is still uh, sort of to be determined as we move into the next round uh, with open enrollment coming up. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike to go through some of the sales and marketing initiatives we've done. Thank you, Ed. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mike Considine, Vice President responsible for our individual small group and mid-sized markets and great to be here today on this panel. I've really enjoyed the presentations preceding ours. I do want to mention a couple things that Ed mentioned that I think is critical, important. Prior to ACA, we had a significant market share in the individual marketplace. So we feel that we were uniquely qualified. We had a strong expertise in that market. But also, New Jersey is one of the more heavily regulated states in the, in the country. And we were already in a guaranteed issue type of a climate. So while ACA had significant changes, we felt that we were in a, in a unique uh, position to be able to do well in that space. So in terms of uh, what we did in terms of consumer engagement and go-to-market, we had several different learnings and in terms of being much more consumer-centric as a, a, an organization. That was a big change for us. Uh, historically, uh, we focused a lot of our attention on the group markets and individual, but not really understanding from a consumer analytical perspective what they are, in fact, looking for. So what we did is we had a very robust consumer analytic uh, program so that we were able to come out with a segmenta segmentation model, so therefore, we were messaging to the uninsured population in a way that would be specific for them. So for instance, our messaging campaigns to a young millennial would look different than an empty nester husband and wife or a coping family with three or four kids. All of their, unique, all of their needs are unique, and we didn't try and treat them in a cookie-cutter approach from a marketing perspective. The other thing that we did is from uh, where we reside here in New Jersey, we're between the New York and Philly markets. So therefore, for us to be spending extensive dollars in terms of radio, 
and TV it really wasn't in our best interest. We determined that the ROI wouldn't be there. So we focused an awful lot of our attention on outdoor, transit, social media, to build awareness for the Horizon products as we started out in 2014 and 15. What we have done now is we have pivoted dramatically uh, to a more targeted digital approach, direct mail, and using email for specific segments as we've been able to capture that type of information moving forward. In terms of where we spent a lot of our time, in New Jersey, about 30% of the uninsured population is actually Hispanic, Latino in, in uh, the 21 counties in New Jersey. So what we did is we put a heavy emphasis on the Latino, Hispanic marketplace. Uh, we launched a Spanish website, extensive grassroots efforts to try and sign as many of the Hispanic Latino members as possible, and we were very successful. We started out with about 8,000 members, and we're gonna, we finished OEP 2016 with over 30,000 members. In addition to that, what we did is in a joint venture, we opened up a Hispanic facility in one of the more densely populated cities uh, called Jersey City in New Jersey that has been a great success in terms of onboarding Hispanic members, clarity around our message, product education, all of those things. And based upon that learning, we have, uh, we're going to be opening up in the next couple days a second site uh, in central New Jersey in another heavily Hispanic uh, area of the state. So that has been very important to us, and we will continue to, to move in that direction. Based on our data and analytics, also the Hispanic population seems to be a lower cost population than our overall population in the individual space. Uh, we essentially have blanketed New Jersey. We are uh, fortunate in that we are a single state blues plan operating for over 84 years. So we were able to leverage a lot of the great relationships on a grassroots basis throughout the state of New Jersey. Uh, we deployed, a, we have Blue to You vans, they're called. And we have done hundreds of community events in all 21 counties of the state. Uh, we have another uh, retail center that we opened up in, when ACCA was launched back in 2014. So the face-to-face -face interaction is critically important. And the fact that we're solely located in New Jersey, we think that that gives us a great advantage. I think the greatest learning that we had, though, is in the area of retention of the membership in the IHC, Individual Marketplace, and the Exchange. And I saw in one of the presentations earlier, in terms of the need for constant uh, value deliverables in the individual market. So, they are absolutely the members doing the math on a monthly basis. They're paying for rent, for food, the premium, and it isn't an annual type of a retention effort. It has to be a monthly retention effort, and in fact, even a weekly retention effort. We have to demonstrate to the consumer member the value of having our coverage and all the value-add components of that program so that each and every month they continue to make payments. Because if you're not showing the value and showing why it is so important for the consumer to continue with that program, we have seen it historically, they will make the determination that the value isn't there and they will lapse the coverage. So we have done all kinds of different things, invested heavily in technology, we've revamped our website, and we have improved our billing, our welcome kits, our education. We've done everything, and that has really delivered uh, results for us in the second half of 2015 and 2016, specifically where we have grown uh, the membership from 168,000 to over 200,000 members. The retention persistency of those members is much greater than it was originally in 2014 and early in 2015. Ed mentioned 
coincidentally, uh, our strategy in terms of our product launch, I mentioned the Omnia product, a fee-for-value program. Right now, we have approximately 80% of all of our members on and off the exchange and individual that have taken this product. So this is a, a huge differentiator in the marketplace for us, and that has, an all, that has also enabled us to be successful. Uh, we've, we've heard from some of the other panelists with regard to SEP, uh, supplementary enrollment. We have been very, very strict requiring documentation uh, that in New Jersey we were more strict than our competitors, and therefore we may not have grown much during the SEP periods, but we also didn't take on the risk that some of our other competitors did in terms of being a little bit more loose in terms of taking on membership without necessary documentation. So that has been a great advantage for us too. So in closing, uh, we have done well in terms of the marketplace. It hasn't been a panacea. We have gone down 2016 to 17. We're going from, uh, uh, there's five carriers in 2017, we're down to two. We don't think that's great for the consumer. We don't think that's great for the carriers. So uh, we do believe that there are structural changes that are going to need to take place. But we are posed to once again provide affordable, quality care in all 21 counties in New Jersey in 2017. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you both so much for sharing your lessons learned and your perspectives <clears throat> on outreach and retention strategies. It's all so timely as we enter open enrollment next week. And we're now so honored to introduce Kevin Cunahan, CEO of the Marketplace and the Deputy Administrator at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, who joins us to share where we are today ahead of open enrollment four and what lies ahead in terms of CMS efforts to ensure a more stable and strong future for the marketplaces. Hi, Catherine. Uh, it, it's Kevin. And, and first, thanks so much for the invitation to, um, to present today and, and talk to the audience. Um, it's, uh, it's also a real pleasure to, uh, to, to be uh, reacquainted with uh, some of the panelists. So, uh, Erica is a longtime uh, uh, person I've known for uh, quite a while and uh, value that. And Calvin I've known for a bit. Uh, Ed and Michael appeared at our June Innovation Forum. Uh, we had another one just in October. Uh, Dr. Patel and John uh, couldn't have presented, I think, the, some of the strategies for success uh, any better in their innovations, uh, certainly as did as did Ed and Michael, so it's a, it's a pleasure being here. Um, I, I'm going to take a little liberty, if you don't mind, Catherine, to uh, be a little bit more concise with our slides. Um, I'm going to begin actually with, uh, with slide five uh, to talk a little bit about uh, where we are uh, with respect to some results to date and talk a little bit about where we're going. And I also would like to spend a little time just talking to some of the, the good thoughts that came out of uh, both Florida Blue and Horizon. Blue Cross with respect to some suggestions um, and, and some of our initial thinking on that. Um, the first is um, uh, I think we all know that um, the ACA now is going into its fourth open enrollment period. Uh, we've, uh, we've been in operations um, actually for three years because that's the operating time that, that we've had. Uh, we've had um, pretty good success, I, I think, to date. When you combine the um, exchange enrollment plus Medicaid expansion, as you know, we're um, we're about 20 million that, uh, that now have access on the uh, uninsured rate uh, has dropped from about 14.4% uh, in 2013 down to 8.6, which is the first time it's been below double digits. So uh, again, um, don't feel like we've solved every problem, obviously, but feel like we're, we're making progress in our, our position to continue um, to do so. Uh, in addition, uh, millions of Americans have now benefited from no longer uh, being subject to pre-existing conditions, uh, having the benefit of, uh, of no longer having uh, lifetime or annual limits, uh, eligibility for uh, preventive care services. Uh, uh, millions and millions of Americans have benefited from law, uh, even outside those that have enrolled in the exchange. So again, good progress being made, uh, obviously more to do. Um, moving to slide seven. Um, the satisfaction with the marketplace is also uh, in, in good shape. Uh, again, opportunity, of course, always to do better. 
uh, but uh, various studies, uh, whether it's JP Power, uh, JD Power, uh, Urban Institute, others have shown that consumers in the marketplace are as satisfied, and in some instances more satisfied, uh, with their uh, enrollment experience and uh, marketplace coverage than actually those with um, uh, employer-sponsored insurance. So again, more to do, but uh, again, I think we're, we continue to make progress. Um, moving on to slide nine, obviously affordability is a core part of what we continue to do and, 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 and will continue to focus in on as we have. Um, roughly 70% of our consumers are able to find plans for less than $100 a month uh, with tax credits. Uh, roughly 83 to 85% of our enrollees overall receive uh, subsidies of some sort, whether that's through AP, uh, advanced premium tax credits or through the cost sharing reductions. Uh, but I, I think it's important for um, your audience to know, Catherine, that, that uh, we care about uh, and are focused in on everybody. So not just subsidized enrollees, but, but uh, all, all enrollees and, and those that are off the exchange too, because this is all about trying to uh, uh, manage care effectively. Uh, premiums, of course, are a manifestation of costs. And uh, certainly we know that the control of health care costs is, is, uh, is the 800-pound gorilla. Uh, and, and it's something that, again, I think when, when you look at macro and other things that have come out of uh, CMS recently, I think we're making progress. Uh, obviously, more to do. Uh, we're very pleased to be working with the, uh, uh, the, the health care carrier partners that you have on the um, uh, program today who, uh, who represent some of the best practices with respect to helping to provide more continued affordability. Um, if we move on to uh, slide 10 um, and we talk a bit about some of the areas that have made such a difference, uh, clearly the financial assistance has been so critical. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, roughly 83% of our enrollees receive uh, tax subsidies, so it makes a huge difference with respect to uh, affordability. Um, again, increasing uh, minimum coverage so that the, the coverage is more comprehensive has also made a huge difference and has, uh, has reduced a lot of some prior issues with respect to bankruptcies uh, due to medical costs or other types of things. A guaranteed issue, uh, the ability now that, uh, that women, and in, 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 in my former state, uh, before I took this job um, in New England, uh, women in fact were charged roughly double uh, what men were for the same coverage. Uh, that has now all gone away. Obviously, as we all know, kids can stay on their parents' plans to 26. And what we are trying to do, and again, have more to do, but clearly are trying to do, is to not only make the enrollment process easier and simpler, uh, but also to make information more transparent. Um, we have introduced uh, a series of uh, new decision support tools uh, last year uh, with respect to uh, pharmacy lookup, facility lookup, uh, the same for uh, prescription drugs. And that is continuing again into, into this year where we have a, a new plan comparison uh, feature uh, that uh, makes shopping uh, and, plan and comparison of plans uh, even easier. Again, that will never stop. Uh, we will always be working in a way to try to make this experience easier, not only for the consumers, but also for our, our carrier partners. One of the things that, we're, that is important for this audience, I think, to understand is, is going into next Tuesday's launch of open enrollment that our system, whether it's the enrollment system, our operations, our, our IT platform and such, continues to be more stable and more efficient. Last year, for example, in open enrollment three, uh, at the peak of enrollment, we were processing uh, roughly nine enrollments per second. And our ability to do that is even expanded this year. So feeling more confident than ever about the service capabilities of our enrollment system and also the consumer experience going to open enrollment four. Um, going into slide 11, uh, talking about some of the early lessons learned, I think that uh, Dr. Patel, uh, John, Ed, and Michael, um, did a very fine job of talking about a couple of things that we've learned. Uh, one, one obvious thing is that the one-size-fits-all approach with respect to either understanding the market or medical management, care coordination, provider contracting, uh, does not seem to work as effectively uh, in, in market, for marketplace enrollees. Uh, one of the things, is, as I mentioned, is we've had uh, forums on issuer innovation uh, twice this year. 
once in June and again in October at the request of, of carriers. And one of the interesting things for us at least is we have begun to understand the commonalities of successful issuers uh, in the marketplace. These are issuers that are both growing and are profitable. And um, they are sharing almost the exact same things. Tactically, they can be different based on the region of the country, based on the provider community. But with respect to the overall category of what they do, they're almost all the same. And so another feature that we've done is we're actually meeting with issuers uh, throughout the country that have expressed interest in understanding that better um, and, and, and meeting with them to walk through uh, some of those. And we're, we're getting a lot of interest in that regard. So that's been a huge lesson for us. We're also, conversely, beginning to understand the commonalities of those issuers that have been less successful. And, and interestingly enough, they also fall into to, to common categories. They're clearly different categories from the ones that have been successful, but they, call in, but they fall into the same buckets of commonality. So that's equally instructive and, and things that we're also sharing uh, nationally with, with issuers. M more to come on that. Um, you know, I believe it was, um, that, that it was Ed uh, who talked about retention uh, and the need for constant uh, deliverables of value and how he spoke to both this being a, a weekly and monthly effort. Uh, that is a best practice. Uh, and, uh, and, and Horizon, by the way, has several uh, best practices. Um, but that point about uh, how to constantly touch the enrollee, constantly show that value is being provided, the type of redesign of their welcome kit, for example, they've done some very clever things, um, have things that we've uh, talked about and, and, and again displayed in, in June. Um, I think what, what John and Dr. Patel spoke about with respect to the, um, the pods and other things that Florida Blue has done uh, has been extremely, extremely instructive. Again, represents best practices that are now being imitated uh, by other companies throughout the country. Um, he also uh, mentioned, uh, as I recall, the importance of, of, of not having a one-size-fits-all approach, uh, the analysis that they've done in the marketplace, uh, the type of um, joint ventures or other alignments that they've had with, with other stakeholders in the state of Florida. Uh, again, very, very thoughtful approach. Uh, finally, uh, I believe that, uh, that Dr. Patel was mentioning the importance of working with leaning indicators looking at, at monitoring such things as ER visits, pharmacy usage, and the importance of claim coding. Couldn't agree with that more. Again, a best practice, clearly finding that that type of, of attention and detail uh, helps make issuers very successful in the marketplace. So uh, very pleased to be able to share some time with, with, uh, with, uh, with both those. Um, a couple of things that came up, and I think that, that John had mentioned that I just wanted to, uh, to uh, to, to provide some reaction to, because I think that these are uh, clearly good uh, issues. One was the issue about the special enrollment periods and um, and the and the and, and the impact of that that can have. Um, one of the uh, areas that, that John that you may know, and, and again and then again you you may not, is that beginning next year we are going to be piloting a, a pre-enrollment mandatory pre-enrollment verification process for all SEPs. Now this is something we've had discussion about with issuers for some period of time now, feel it's the right thing to do, want to test it uh, at, at the uh, request of issuers and the trade associations. And so pleased to be able to announce that um, because we clearly want to be responsive to that concern. Uh, the second was around the issue of third-party payments. Um, couldn't agree with that concern more. Uh, a month ago we published an RFI on that with respect to soliciting comments on proposed ways that we can do that. Uh, we've had some good reaction to that. We're, we're moving ahead with that very aggressively. And over the next month or so, you're going to see some response to that. Um, the uh, grace period issue, uh, the 90-day grace period, that I think, as so many folks may know, is a statutory uh, requirement. Uh, we'll require a change to the statute to address that. Again, think there's a lot of opportunity for good discussion about that. But, but that, is a, that is a statutory issue, and we certainly hope we're going to get the cooperation of Congress to, to look at that and, and, and other things that need to be tweaked. The President, uh, a couple of months ago, in a, in a JAMA article, outlined other ideas that, uh, that he had had with respect to uh, ways to make the, the exchange in the marketplace uh, improved. And so clearly, good opportunity for rich discussion there. 
So in conclusion, um, I, I just a, a couple things to say. Uh, one is that uh, moving into open enrollment for, I'm actually more optimistic about the marketplace than I've ever been. And, and the reason why is because, A, we see a good pattern of success uh, by issuers, and I, I think we've seen a couple of great examples uh, this afternoon. The second is, and perhaps this is most important from our perspective, is the level of engagement by issuers nationally that are saying, hey, help me be like those guys. What can I do to understand what they've done? Can you help me understand these best practices and how I could incorporate them? I may need to tweak them. I need to change them. I may need to modify. You know, being in the Midwest is going to be different than in the South or in the Northeast, but I understand that people are people and that this is important to do and I want to make it work. That, that type of engagement and commitment is so critical to the success because we know that leadership is critical here. The most successful uh, issuers in the marketplace have a core commonality from the beginning, which is commitment from leadership. So that's one of the reasons I think that, that we're most optimistic about how things are working. With respect to, again, stability of the system, best shape we've ever been in. Uh, outreach, uh, we are more sophisticated and, uh, and refined with our messaging. We understand the things that work. We understand the messages that don't work. We understand the messages that can get to populations that are critical to grow, such as the 18 to 34 segment. Extensive research there, and we've doubled our budget uh, to help reach those folks and, and to enroll them. So again, excited about open enrollment for uh, recognizing, too, that this is, uh, this, this is never going to be finished in uh, three or four years. Uh, this has always been a multi-year project. But uh, very excited about next Tuesday, and again, appreciate the opportunity to be on this uh, with these distinguished folks. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and share uh, your perspective, and thanks to all of our speakers. Uh, we do have a few minutes now for question and answer, and we have a great audience today of health plan and state leaders as well as policy leaders. <clears throat> so please do submit your questions um, through the the Q&A box uh, right now on your screen, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Oh, oh, I'm going to try to combine a couple questions here together, and, and Kevin just alluded to one potential change, but the question is that what changes would you recommend to ensure more stability and competition in the exchanges for 2018, and some specific things the audience would like our speakers to comment on <clears throat> are the proposals to extend reinsurance, uh, other options to bring the younger population into the exchange, such as eliminating the three-to-one age rating ratio, um, or are there other benefit designs uh, to attract the young and healthy population? So I'll open that up to the panel. Well, Catherine, it's Kevin. I'm going to I'm going to try to uh, break the ice here a little bit. Um, uh, Hopefully, um, a couple of the uh, thoughts that were mentioned, that I mentioned just a few minutes ago, were attempts to help do that. Uh, I think it's important that, um, that we all understand that uh, we try to work as collaboratively as we can with the carriers and with the state DOIs to, to help understand what's working and what can be improved. So a lot of the things I mentioned were uh, examples of, um, of, uh, of uh, in response to those. Not to say there aren't others. And again, we consider ourselves a learning organization, so we always want to try to understand what uh, what can be most effective. Uh, no, I can jump in as well as Lauren Adler from Brookings. I guess this is kind of our uh, <laughs> our, our job at Brookings is uh, doing a lot of this sort of uh, policy proposal work. So, um, I mean, a lot of these have been mentioned already, and I think we agree with a lot of the folks who spoke already. There's a lot of work on uh, extending uh, extending reinsurance or risk orders could do a lot. Um, improving the risk adjustment program, tightening uh, special enrollment periods, um, and things like that definitely uh, move in the direction. Um, I think there are avenues to increase the size of markets, um, whether that is uh, combining the individual and small group markets, which would need to be combined with restrictions on self-insurance in small group markets, um, could potentially help uh, get more folks into these markets. Uh, and then there are sort of, uh, it, it's very possible that there may be a need eventually to move some sort of subsidies to folks above 400% of poverty um, to get more uh, healthy people into these markets. Great. 
Great, thank you. <clears throat> uh, to tee off uh, your comment, Lauren, another question that came in had to do with those Americans that aren't eligible for subsidies and, and also are purchasing coverage off the exchange. <clears throat> We're still trying to understand this population and what do you all see happening with that? What's the risk that they're going to drop coverage in 2017 with these increases and what are some of the things the health plans are going to continue to do to reach that population? open to anyone. This is Prakash. I'll take a stab at that. There's a number of things that we're trying to do. Um, I think trying to reach the, the younger population is uh, is not the easiest thing, as we all know, and lots of lots of folks are spending quite a bit of time and resources trying to do that. Um, I think we're like the rest of the approaches we talked about. There is no single one approach, and it varies by local marketplace. And uh, but things that we're trying to do uh, include going to the community, going where the young people are, um, where we can try to uh, try to gain visibility and educate uh, why it's so important to. To, to, uh, to engage in the exchange uh, and enroll. Uh, we're using language-specific tools. We're using digital tools. We have our um, retail sites, which are located where uh, younger people aggregate um, so, uh, and congregate. So we're, we're trying to do our best to try to get out there and, and, and reach the younger population, but it's not, the, uh, it's not the easiest thing for us to do. And you know, the penalties don't seem to have much of an impact there. I do think being able to uh, address the uh, the cost part of this, um, where where subsidies may not be av uh, available for the younger population, maybe that three to one ratio. If we were able to expand that, um, it, that might help uh, allow us to lower you know lower the cost even more for younger, healthier enrollees. I think that might make a difference. But again, it's not a single single approach. It's uh, Ed Lara from Horizon. I'll just add to, to that by reinforcing something that Mike talked about earlier. Um, for, for this population in particular, they're really making these hard trade-offs between the money they pay for their monthly premium versus everything else they're spending on. And given that most of them or many of them don't really have a lot of health care needs, um, how do you justify that monthly outlay? What else are they getting? And that's part of the challenge we're facing now. We're trying to figure out how, we, how can we help you understand what you get for that premium if you're not really seeing your doctor? What are the other added value benefits you give? So we're doing a lot of testing now and innovation around trying to create a newer value proposition outside of you can get to see your doctor for a lower rate because they don't really see their doctor. So more to come on that. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, it's, it's Kevin. Um, I'd be interested in um, maybe some others' responses to this, but um, we've seen nationally that uh, a number of carriers are introducing new incentive or loyalty programs to not only improve retention, but also to try to incent people to either complete an HRA, um, go to the doctor, um, do other kinds of things that they think benefit their health. So um, that's another trend we've seen. Great, thank you. Um, a few questions have come in just about uh, the difficulties ensuring el eligibility and um, verifying eligibility during open enrollment, especially related to those eligible for Medicaid or Medicare. <clears throat> and the question is, um, what is CMS doing to ensure eligibility is verified to ensure they're not being uh, duly enrolled and directed to the right, right insurance? So this is, um, this is an issue uh, along also with um, the risk that people could be uh, insured for both Medicare or not being um, enrolled in Medicare when they should be, um, that we've done a fair amount of work on. And so we've got some redesigns in the website with respect to uh, pop-up commentary. Um, so as people work through the application that they are reminded of these programs, Obviously, uh, if the income is showing that, in fact, they're Medicaid eligible, 
there is a notice that is sent to the appropriate state Medicaid agency um, to, uh, to allow them to facilitate their enrollment. Great, thank you. Um, another question here. <clears throat> You know, we've talked a lot about um, some of the higher costs for this population, and do any, does anyone have any thoughts about the role of care coordination and coordinate and the role of care coordination in reducing costs? For example, following up with members, uh, reduce ER utilization, ensuring better preventive care. We, we've heard a few examples today, but does anyone want to elaborate on that? Perhaps the, the Florida folks. I mean, I'll certainly. This is Prakash again. I'll uh, I'll comment. Uh, we we obviously with the uh, the pods that I described uh, are focused on a subset of the of the ACA population uh, in terms of the complex care needs. But coordination um, is critical. It's a critical, frankly, through uh, non ACA as well. Uh, I would say that uh, because these populations uh, often are used to going to the emergency room is their point of entry into the healthcare healthcare system. They don't have primary care physicians. Often don't think of their you know PCP uh, as the as the entry point. There's a lot of education, tremendous amount of education. We are looking at an, uh, other types of alignments and incentives, but this is a uh, very hands-on, heavy approach working with the providers and ourselves uh, to try to reach these populations, bring them in, uh, show them the value, uh, make sure they have a great experience. So the kind of providers we've chosen uh, also are very focused on that and obviously have incentives. Uh, but this is a 360 hands-on approach that's very, very deep. Um, coordination, I would say, in healthcare navigation go along with this, uh, very important. So when they come in, they're not just getting uh, evaluated or when we connect with them, we're not just talking about a particular issue, but they're really thinking about the holistic approach to these members. Um, but it's using high-tech tools with uh, heavy hands-on uh, approach. Great, thank you. Um, and another question has to do with um, people having a good choice of providers and uh, this person's wondering if anyone's aware of any data on uh, doctors' attitudes towards the marketplace plans these past few years and, and how difficult it is to keep um, doctors engaged uh, in these networks. This is Prakash, I'll just uh, add for what we've experienced here, um, addressing the needs and just described how heavy hands-on approach this is. Um, so this, the, the membership is, you know, again, is not for all providers and all providers can't be all things to our members and frankly we can't be all things to all providers either. So it is matching of expectations and needs. Uh, you know, provider attitudes are going to vary by marketplace and by market share and what other products and members you might bring to that member. Um, so this goes back to what was commented earlier by a number of us that the one size does not fit all one. One size doesn't fit all and, and um, each of our provider groups we've had to make uh, trade-offs and which providers we're going to have for which products, which is unique for us, may not be for other marketplaces, but we are trying our best to match the uh, provider that's well suited and capable, you know, from an office perspective, from a care perspective, from an experience perspective, and a management perspective, to be able to address the needs of these members. Um, but it also means a number of, of, of uh, providers have to be excluded as well for, you know, for reasons that they can address those things. I would say the attitudes have gotten better, uh, more interest in serving these members, actually not less here in Florida at least. Um, has to probably do a lot of, you know, by and large with the size of our marketplace. We have the largest exchange marketplace in the, in the country, so it, it, you know, there is a, um, you know, patient uh, capture opportunity for, for these providers. Uh, and then I think, you know, given the market share that some of us have, we're able to, you know, to, to leverage that uh, as well. And then also the success that these providers may have had with other populations where they have to have a heavy hands-on approach, be it Medicaid or even, you know, duals or MA, 
that also colors their, um, you know, their interest and experience and expertise in managing these populations. Yeah, um, this is Kevin. Um, something else that we're seeing that I'd be also interested in seeing what the other panelists may have to say is we're seeing a growing trend by issuers developing joint ventures with provider organizations, uh, IDNs, PHOs, others. Um, and I think someone had mentioned earlier about um, some types of um, provider incentives or types of other arrangements. So we are seeing the, um, we're seeing that, that trend growing. Great, thank you. Um, a, a few questions uh, have come in, and a few of you have, have touched on this, but maybe you can elaborate a little more. Um, some questions about uh, this concern about the third-party payments. <clears throat> and there's been some uh, attention paid to how some dialysis companies are paying pro premiums through uh, nonprofits <clears throat> um, in turn for the, the higher reimbursement through the exchange plans. Can can anyone elaborate for the audience sort of on why this is concerning and, and what can be done about it? I know Kevin said that we can look for something on that topic. Uh, Catherine, this is Calvin Anderson, Tennessee, and I'll take a stab at it and, again, commend uh, Kevin for uh, what CMS issued on their RFI on the subject. What uh, our concern about that was that when you had an entity that was making uh, premium payment decision uh, uh, that was connected directly to the uh, provider associated with it, we thought was the standpoint of a little bit of gaming of the system, that you should have clear rules around uh, those that would be doing premium support, and that should be uh, clearly outlined in a design policy to which uh, the ones associated with the uh, dialysis clinic were a glaring example of where there was a lack of real definition of rules that they were operating on. It was uh, even the standpoint of switching people from uh, coverage that they had to marketplace coverage because it offered uh, the, uh, uh, a greater reimbursement rate. So those were things that obviously added to the cost, but just the standpoint of added to the uncertainty that you would expect a set of rules that would be pretty clear that uh, everyone participating would be following, and that way you can make your claims and, and uh, adjustments around that. Thanks, Calvin. And I will let Kevin have the last word if he wants to comment on that or offer us any kind of closing thoughts on the today's event. Um, well, thanks. Um, first of all, thanks so much for uh, uh, convening this um, and also for having this, um, uh, these panelists. Uh, just to res with respect to the, the last subject, I, I think I did mention that this is something that has been raised by uh, issuers. It's something that we're um, highly sensitive to and uh, are, uh, are responding to. So, um, you know, understand the issue and, and, uh, and, and, and fully get it. Um, you know, this to me has been an extremely helpful sort of combination of, 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 of looking at a variety of different stakeholders, uh, whether they be on the consulting research carrier side that are talking about something we all have in common, which is really how do we make this law work most effectively uh, for, for everybody? How do we keep it affordable? Uh, how do we provide good choice and access and, uh, and high quality products? Uh, again, I think there are great examples here of carriers that are doing that so well. Uh, we're very encouraged by them and uh, believe that they represent best practices nationally. So thanks again for convening this and, and for inviting us. Well, thank you so much, and thank you to our excellent panel of speakers. We hope that our audience found it useful. <clears throat> um, we will have a recording of the event and post slides online in case you missed any of the presentations or, or any of the slides, and would encourage you to share them with your colleagues as well. We'd also invite your uh, feedback on the event at the link on your screen. And thank you all again for joining us today.